Sok szeretettel és nagy tisztelettel köszöntöm Önöket a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia Pedagógiai Bizottsága és az Eszterházi Károly Főiskola által megrendezett Országos Nevelés Tudományi Konferencián. Imáron 13. alkalommal tartandó szakmai fórum azt a célt szolgálja, hogy a nevelés tudományi kutatások és a pedagógia napi gyakorlatában egyre intenzívebb kihívásként jelentkező tanulási környezetek változásának elméleti és gyakorlati kérdéseit megvitassuk. Ennek jegyében az idei szakmai diskurzusunk címe Változó életformák, régi és új tanulási környezetek. Rendhagyó módon tegnap a nulladik nap keretében az információs és kommunikációs technológia és az elektronikus tanulási környezetek köznevelési és felsőoktatási gyakorlati alkalmazásával kapcsolatos előadásokat hallgathattak meg. Mától pedig neves hazai és külföldi előadók plenáris előadásukkal gazdagítják a szakmai fórumot, amelyet a konferencia honlapján közvetítünk. Emellett tematikus előadások, szimpóziumok, poszterbemutató és kulturális programok is várnak kedves vendégeinkre. Igen, tisztelt Hölgyem és Uraim! Eger megyei Guváros önkormányzata, Eger város polgárai Igen. nevében köszöntöm Önöket nagy tisztelettel. Őszintén szólva ritkán van olyan érzésem, hogy az előttem szóló, azokat a gondolatokat fogalmazza meg szinte teljes mértékben, amikkel én is egy picit készülődtem a mai találkozásra. Nos, Eger egy történelmi város, a kultúra magyar városa, ezer éves hagyományokkal rendelkező település, amelyben az iskola ügynek, a fiatal generációkról való gondoskodásnak nagyon komoly hagyományai vannak. Említhetnék sok mindenkit, Elsőként talán Telekesi Istvánt, aki 1699-től tevékenykedett Egervárosban, és az EGRI papnevelő intézetet alapította meg. Rektor úr is említette természetesen Eszterházi Károlyt, akinek az Egerbe érkezését a tavalyi esztendőben ünnepeltük ennek a 250. évfordulóját. Ő volt az, aki ezt az egyetemi házat megépítette, Magyarország területén az első épületet, amelyet egyetemi célra létesítettek. De említhetném Pirker Jánost is, aki 1826-tól működött Egerben, és aki a művészetek nagy mecénása volt, emellett nagy büszkeségünk, hogy az első magyar nyelvű tanítóképzőt alapította itt Egerben. És sorolni lehet az egri püspököket, érsekeket, azokat a nagyformátumú személyiséket, akiknek az életművére Egerben lehet alapozni. Eger ma is iskolaváros, ahol állami, egyházi, fenntartású intézmények mellett az önkormányzat is komoly szerepet vállal, ma nem iskola fenntartóként, de iskola működtetőként, támogatóként, éppen a napokban adtunk át rendeltetésének egy közel 300 millió forintos beruházás eredményeként egy középiskolai kollégiumot. Eger tehát elkötelezett az iskola ügy a magyar tanügy mellett, és megmondom őszintén, hogy én közgazdászként valami hasonlót gondolok, mint rektor úr. Ha van tudományág, amelyiknek meghatározó szerepe lehet a jelen és a jövő konfliktusainak, problémáinak a Globális világ kihívásainak kezelésében én úgy gondolom, hogy ez a nevelés tudomány feltétlenül, és ha Egerehez valamit is hozzájárulhat, akkor úgy gondolom ez a város nem tevékenykedik hiába. Tartalmas tanácskozást, szép élményeket kívánok önöknek Egerben. Köszönöm megtisztelő figyelmüket. Itt van körünkben elfogadta meghívásunkat. Dr. Rárli Katalin, a Nemzeti Erőforrások Minisztériumának főtanácsos asszonya, megkérném, hogy tartsa meg ő is üdvözlő beszédét. Tisztelt konferencia, kedves kollégák! Én helyettes államtitkár úr, illetve államtitkár úr üzenetét hadd hozzam az oktatásért felelős emberi erőforrások minisztériumából, a felsőoktatás területéről. 
Szakmailag azt gondolom ezt a rendezvényt házigazdaként most is a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia képviseli, de annak üzenete van, hogy a rendezvény ismételten egy felsoktatási intézményben kapott helyet, és a felsoktatási intézmény az, amelyik ehhez a feltételeket itt biztosította. Köszöntőként szakmai hosszú távú kérdésekre az embernek nincs lehetősége. Néhány gondolatot azért azt gondolom, hogy a hely aktualitása, illetve a téma aktualitása mindenképpen fontos, hogy önmagunk számára, de legalábbis számunkra a tárca számára üzenetet hordoz. Az egyik ilyen fontos kérdés, hogy az egész oktatási rendszer, amelyik legalább négy ágazatot foglal magába, ugye a közoktatási rendszert, a felsoktatási rendszert, a felnőtt képzési rendszert és a szakképzési rendszert. Ezek az ágazatok 2011 után a saját jogalkotási rendjüknek megfelelően, szakmai fejlődésüknek megfelelően új ágat, új terepet, új tartalmi megújulásokat hordoznak magukban. Neveléstörténeti kérdéskör lesz majd, hogy ezek a változások, ezek a fejlesztések hogyan indították el a közoktatásban ezt az új tanévet, ahol itt tulajdonképpen megindulnak az új programok, új tartalmi fejlesztés alapján az oktatási évfolyamok, hogyan alakul a felnőtt képzés, hogyan változik meg az a szakképzési rendszer, amelyben a munkaerőpiaci igényekhez való igazodás hangsúlya került előtérbe, egyáltalán az ágazatok közötti arányok, feladatmegosztások hogyan alakulnak. Ehhez képest ismételten új feladat előtt állunk, és az a helyszín, hogy itt az akadémia és a tudomány, a neveléstudomány gondolatkörében kutató, fejlesztési feladatokat vállaló szakemberek egyrészt információt és tapasztalatot adnak önmaguk számára és társaik számára az elmúlt egy év, 12. év óta eltelt, vagy 12. konferencia óta eltelt eredményekről. Egy új lehetőséggel is biztosan, hogy kell, hogy számoljanak, hogy hogyan indul az a 13. konferencia utáni időszak, amelyben most oktatási rendszerként egy európai közösségi gondolkodásban a 14-20-as európai fejlesztési törekvéshez kapcsolódóan kell minden ágazatnak külön is és együttműködésben is megtervezni azokat az utakat, amelyben az oktatás az adott társadalom munkerőpiaci fejlődéséhez, foglalkoztatási kérdéseihez kapcsolódik, a maga terepével és maga szerepével együtt. Ebben mindenképpen azt gondolom, hogy jogosultsága van annak a témakörnek, amely a különböző tanulási helyzeteket, környezetet, a különböző ágazatokhoz kapcsolódó feltételeket, illetve az általán üzeneteket, megfogalmazott üzeneteket viszik egy konferencia keretében. Ebből a szempontból és ehhez kapcsolódóan kívánok én olyan e, sikeres e, szép napot a mai napon és az elkövetkezendő két napban, amelyben az ágazatok egymás közötti beszédére, e, e, gondolatok közvetítésére és netán egy hosszabb távú együttműködés megalapozására is és közös gondolkodási úton való tovább lépésére is lehetőség nyílik. Köszönöm szépen! És végül, de nem utolsó sorban adom át a szót dr. Kistót Lajosnak, a konferencia elnökének. Szép jó napot kívánok mindenkinek! Először is nagy-nagy elnézést kérek ezért a kezdésért. Megmondom őszintén, ennyire nem akartuk demonstrálni a változó világot, mint ott itt sikerült egy-két percben a régi és új tanulási környezeteket. Nagy tisztelettel köszöntöm minden kedves résztvevőt, külön nagy szeretettel köszöntöm a külföldi résztvevőket, őket név szerinti Simonetta Polengi asszonyt Olaszországból, François Ruét Franciaországból, Andy Hargraves Amerikai Egyesült Államokból és Barabási Albert Lászlót, aki délután fog érkezni, és tölti velünk itt a konferencia idejét, illetve tart előadást. Külön tisztelettel szeretném köszönteni rajtuk kívül a Romániai Magyar Pedagógusok Szövetsége örökös elnökét, illetve jelenlegi elnökét, akik megtisztelték a konferenciánkat, főtanácsos asszonyt az Emberi Erőforrások Minisztérium képviseletébe, 
az Oktatás Kutató és Fejlesztői Intézet vezetőjét, munkatársait, az Oktatási Hivatal vezetőit, munkatársait, a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia Pedagógiai Tudományos Bizottságának minden egyes tagját. És természetesen minden szimpózium és szekció elnököt, opponenst és előadót, és minden kedves résztvevőt, akik eljöttek Egerbe. A programbizottság úgymond elvégezte a munkáját, és jelenthetem, hogy 485 regisztrált résztvevője van a konferenciának, akik itt a három napban, hogy úgy mondjam, jelen lesznek. 186 tematikus előadást fogunk meghallgatni, és ezen kívül 50 szimpóziumban, mintegy 207 előadás fog elhangzani. Ezen kívül még 19 poszter tetszenek megtekinteni itt az első emeleten. Én nagyon kívánom önöknek, hogy érezzék jól magukat Egerbe, legyenek eredményesek ezen a konferencián. Mi próbáltunk mindenel hozzájárulni ahhoz, hogy némi élményt szerezzünk, úgyhogy a regisztrációnakkor kapott táskába tetszenek találni egy emlékkötetet, egy úgynevezett hasonlás kiadást, amit lényegében a konferencia tiszteletére nyomtunk ki, ami egy kicsit a büszkeségünk, hiszen Benkóci Emil a Pirker első magyar tanítóképzője centenáriumára megjelent könyv hasonlás kiadását jelenti, és ezzel tisztelgünk lényegében annak a 250 évnek, ami itt a Liceum felsőoktatásához kötődik, hiszen éppen a múlt évben ünnepeltük ezt az évfordulót. Mivel a konferencia programja rendkívül sűrű, ezért bizonyos élményeket próbáltunk elrejteni egyrészt ebbe a könyvbe, másrészt mindenkinek a regisztrációs kártyája fejet, ugye egy pendrive található, ezen a pendrive-on egy 20 perces filmet tetszenek találni, ami egy picit egy Balázs Béla díjas filmrendezőnek az alkotása, aki összehozta Egerbe két zászlós dolgunkat, egyik Gárdonyi Géza, Egri Csillagok és az Egri Bor valamilyen művészi vízióját. Úgyhogy ezt majd otthon tessék megnézni ezt a filmet. Nagyon köszönöm a támogatóknak, hogy lehetővé tették, hogy ilyen körülmények között ezt a konferenciát megrendezzük. Így külön köszönöm a Samsung képviseletének, hogy egyrészt a konferencia támogatását eszközeivel, illetve egy pici standrátogatásra is hívnak mindenkit, hiszen a táskába egy, egy kérdőívet tetszenek találni, és nagyon reméljük, hogy aki meglátogatja a standjukat, az egy tablettet esetleg nyerhet is itt a végére, és a régi és új tanulási környezetét, hogy úgy mondjam, gazdagíthatja ezzel az eszközzel. Nagyon szeretném kérni mindenkit, hogy pláne most, hogy az első percek így sikerültek, hogy minden percét próbáljuk meg kihasználni, próbáljuk meg behozni ezt az időt. Nagyon feszes ütembe, itt főleg a szekció elnököket kérném, hogy nagyon szigorúan feszes ütembe pontosan persze próbálják befejezni a, a programot, mert tényleg azt mondom, hogy akkor nem tudjuk teljesíteni a három napot, és szombat délbe nem tudjuk úgy befejezni, hogy minden egyes vállalt feladatunknak eleget tettünk. Még egyszer nagyon élvezetes EGRI napokat, és nagyon eredményes konferenciát kívánok mindenkinek. Köszönöm szépen a figyelmet! Köszönjük szépen, elnök úrnak! Kedves vendégeink, ezzel a, meghívó formális rész, a megnyitó formális része véget ért, a plenáris előadások következnek. Elsőként felkérném Tarnóc András urat, az, hogy laudációját tartsa meg, és jó tanácshozást kívánok! Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's it's a tremendous honor to to stand here and to be able to uh, to make make this speech to welcome uh, the special conference guests from the professional community on behalf of the uh, Estarzi Kari College and especially on behalf of the uh, conference organizers. 
we are uh, very uh, grateful for the fact that uh, we can welcome here four outstanding members of the global educational community, uh, representing uh, two uh, professors uh, from the United States and uh, two from uh, uh, Europe. And um, uh, first of all, I would like to mention the names again and then uh, introduce our first uh, uh, presenter. Today we have uh, uh, two presentations, um, one by uh, Professor Andrew Hargraves and uh, also by Jean Professor Jean-Francois Rouet. Uh, tomorrow we have also two uh, uh, presentations by Professor uh, uh, Albert Laszlo Barabashi and also uh, from Professor Simonetta Polengi. Uh, let me introduce our first uh, presenter, Professor uh, Andrew uh, Hargraves. Professor Andrew Hargraves is the Thomas Brennan Chair of the Lynch School of the Boston College of Education. The Lynch School of Boston College of Education is dedicated to the promotion of justice and uh, uh, equality in the education process, uh, primarily through the combination of uh, our, our world's uh, uh, in a way, uh, tools to make our, our world uh, better. Uh, Professor Hargraves uh, is an internationally known uh, scholar, respected scholar and also educator and consultant. Uh, his, uh, he has produced over, uh, co-authored, edited and written over uh, 42 uh, books and publications, out of which uh, we would like to mention, uh, among others, the uh, Changing Teaching and uh, Changing the World, The Global Fourth Way, and in uh, 2002, co-authored with Michael Fullen, a work titled Professional Capital, which uh, is a revolutionary way of, of looking at the teaching process. And his presentation will also uh, deal with this. The title of his uh, uh, presentation is Professional Capital as a Way of Promoting Teaching Quality. Professor Hargraves. Good morning. How do you say that in Hungarian? Good morning. You want to say it to me? Thoreg. Oh, okay. You can show me after. Okay, good, good. Um, it is an honor uh, to be here at the invitation of, uh, of Andras and in this magnificent uh, building at this crossroads of history which Aguirre stands at in, in the world. And I'm going to try and talk to you about a new idea uh, today and I'll make it a little shorter than I planned so that we can recover some time uh, during the day. Uh, but it, it begins with a, a short uh, story. Uh, about two weeks ago, I was in the Netherlands. I was in The Hague, uh, Den Haag in, in the Netherlands. And uh, I was part of a conference there, and we were, uh, as part of it, we were interviewed by children, uh, eight-year-old uh, children. And the topic of the whole conference uh, was 21st century learning and teaching. Ev everywhere people are trying to work out what the 21st century is even though it's already 13 years old. And uh, the children have been preparing questions for all the speakers and uh, they prepared them with their classmates and th there were some very good questions. Uh, what is the difference between a 21st century teacher and a 20th century teacher? Who is responsible for the learning, the teacher or the child? Um, I, I thought I was answering these very well. I thought up against eight-year-olds, I was pretty impressive, actually, until the very end of the conversation where they'd been allowed in their own writing to write a little question of their own. And then this eight-year-old child said to me, he said, so, he said, you're a professor. I said, yes. He said, so, what have you invented? <laughs> and I thought this was a really good question. 
and I didn't immediately have an answer for it, which I said. I said, this, this is a really good question. And I said, some of my answer will be disappointing. I said, I haven't invented a, a cure for a terrible disease. I haven't invented a new way to fly. I haven't even invented an app for your iPhone. Uh, because one of these eight-year-olds had 50 followers on Twitter, by the way. I haven't invented any of these things, but I think what I've tried to invent, and what the speakers here, and uh, many of you who do this work, try to invent, are new ways of doing things. New ways of thinking about or doing learning. New ways of thinking about or doing teaching, new ways of thinking about how we organize teaching so it brings out the best in learning for this time that we are in. And now I will need to find my presentation on here, but in a moment it will magically appear, probably like this. There we go. You can see it coming now. All right, so, and uh, I'm a Mac person, not a, a PC, so what is the next thing I press here? It's this one there. Brilliant, there we go. There we go. So this is really the theme of today, and given, uh, given that this is where we are, we're in Hungary, I thought I'd show you some very familiar slides about the Hungarian education system. So you will know, for example, no, so let's try this. It's okay, we can use this. Uh, do you know this table, many of you? These are the international uh, PISA tables of uh, student achievement, and uh, uh, they measure uh, various things, reading, uh, maths, and science. And uh, Hungary is um, uh, not too good, but, but with the United Kingdom, which is the country that I come from. So, so we're about the same. We're about uh, two-thirds two -thirds of the way down here. Never get too depressed about where you are in relation to other countries. Don't get too depressed because it's not the ranking that matters. If you notice here, there are only six points in difference between all these countries. The differences are very tiny. This, this is this is really all one group, Sweden, Germany, Ireland, France, Denmark, United Kingdom, Hungary, and then there's a bit of a gap. <laughs> so it's not as bad, it's, no, it's not fantastic, but on Pisa it's not as bad as it seems, or as people will sometimes tell you. That's the first thing to think about. The second thing is, uh, this is pearls. These are the international reading assessments. These are actually organized by my home institution, Boston College, in the United uh, States. And uh, there's Hungary doing a little better, actually, this time. And in a bunch around uh, other countries in the region, the Slovak Republic, uh, Bulgaria, and above Portugal, Israel, Germany, but still a long way from the people at the top. Here's Tim's International Maths and Science. Uh, you have historically, in fact, you're famous for doing very well in uh, maths and science achievement as we traditionally understand it. This is uh, grade, eight, grade eight. And uh, when in North America we get um, uh, immigrant families coming in from Hungary and other parts of this region, children often find they are far ahead than compared to their peers at the same age in their maths and science skills and abilities. So 
uh, in, in these areas, you are in, in many respects a leader in the world, not, not a follower. And this is also true in science as well as, as, well as in maths. But there's two areas to be concerned about. Two areas to be concerned about. This is one. And um, the minister, I'm, I'm sure, will be very familiar with, uh, with the next chart. Uh, the, the next chart basically shows uh, two things. It, it shows from, uh, from the bottom to the top how high your score is. So it shows what is your average standard overall in relation to other countries. So the top countries are the highest performers in the world. We know this on PISA like Shanghai, Korea, Finland, Canada. And we know some of the countries doing uh, uh, not so well in the developed or emerging economies are countries like Mexico and Brazil. The other way, uh, right to left, is a measure of equity. So this is a measure of how much can you predict how well the child will do based on the family that they come from and the income or the wealth or the poverty of the family. So if you are over this side, whoops, let's go back. If you are over this side, the family makes some difference but very little difference. Which family you come from makes little difference to your chances in education. If you uh, live in Iceland, if you live in Norway, Japan, Canada, uh, Finland, if you live in these places, it's the school that has the biggest effect on where you are likely to go in your future. The school, not the family. But if you go over this side, the more you move from right to left, the more it is, the less influence the school has and the more influence the family has. And the greatest inequity of all the OECD countries is Hungary. The school in Hungary relative to the family has the smallest impact of all the OECD countries. And this, I would say, although people will say where we need to go is up here in terms of the standard. I would suggest to you where you need to move is up a bit in the standard, but mainly across in the equity. And ask questions of yourselves. What is it that is creating this inequity? Is it other areas of support within the society? Is it social care, early childhood care, or the things we do for families, housing? Or is it things we do in the schools, like streaming and tracking? Because we know that systems where there are streaming and tracking by ability create greater inequity. And what do we do about the abilities of our teachers? Because countries where the abilities of the teachers are not strong are more inclined to track their students. So there's a narrower group of students and the teacher only has to concentrate with one kind of instruction on the single group. The countries that do better in equity have teachers who can deal with a wider range of abilities and ways of learning within their class. So the challenge here is a challenge of the society and care outside the school. It's a challenge of the school organization to be more diverse and inclusive in every class. And it's a challenge of the teachers to have the skills and capacities to work with many different kinds of children, including those who struggle within the same class. This is one of the things that I wanted to point out to you. And I, I do uh, do reviews of countries with the OECD. So we've been to Finland and we've been just been to, to Wales, the country of Wales in, in the UK. So we have a lot of uh, experience trying to figure out these issues. And the other thing is, 
This is a table, UNICEF's table of child well-being. Do you know this table? These, these are measures of health and happiness amongst 15-year-olds within the society. And what you see here is Hungary is not doing so well. Uh, though the good news for you, the United States is doing, where I live now, is doing the worst of all. There's always somebody worse than yourself. <laughs> so Hungary is not doing so well. It does quite well on education, where it's number eight. But it does very poorly in these other areas. Housing, behaviors and risks like uh, 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 drugs, uh, crime, and so on, and uh, health and safety. So it does less well in these areas. We could conclude if we compare this with Tim's. What would we conclude? Would we conclude that Hungarians or some Hungarians are successful but not so happy? Successful but not so happy. And I'd say that as you look at your standards and you look at your achievement, these other outcomes are as important as how you do in maths and science and literacy. Not instead, but they're as important. So we're going to need teachers everywhere in the 21st century who can give all children a chance, not just those who come from privileged families, who can work with diverse classes, who can include children with special needs in their own class instead of those children having to be segregated in a separate class. And again, the, the best countries, you, certainly the European ones, are more inclusive of children with special educational needs and who pay attention to the well-being of the child, the child as a whole person, and not only the cognitive development of the child. So, how do we address this? Well, in Eger, we're at a crossroads of history, and in a way for teaching, we're at a crossroads for the future of teaching, not just in Hungary, but in many places. And Woody Allen put it in a depressing way like this. He said, More than at any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to total despair and utter hopelessness. the other to total extinction. <laughs> Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. Well, for the future of teaching, we have a choice that's a bit less depressing than this. And it really revolves around the idea of teaching as a kind, not as a cost, not as a drain, not as an expense, not as a wage to keep low when recessions are hard and money is tight, but teaching as an investment, as an investment, as one of the previous speakers said, in the next generation, in the future of the country, as a kind of capital. What is capital? Well, whether you are Karl Marx, who some of you will remember, actually, do not forget. Whether you are Karl Marx or whether I know this creates, it's important not to forget, it's very important to, to change and to move but never forget. Whether you are Karl Marx or whether you are Adam Smith, capital means this. It's about really adding value to net worth. Now, Marx and Smith had different points of view about the consequences of that, but they both held the similar view that capital is what adds value to net worth. 
If you want a return, you have to make an investment. It's very simple. But there are two different views of capital around the world now that are inf influencing the big debate in policy, in policy about the future of teaching. Common to both of them is this. Common to both of them is the understanding that within the school, not outside it, but within the school, the most important influence on student learning is not the curriculum or the standards or the assessment, it's the teaching. The most important influence within the school is the teaching. It's not even the leader, it's the teacher. Three good teachers in a row and a child will do very well. You think if you're a parent, what it feels like when your child gets three bad teachers in a row and the effect that that has on them. So, the teacher is important, but here are two views. The first is, and this is very common in the Anglo-Saxon countries, in America, in England, in Australia, and in one or two others, and in other countries as well now outside, like Sweden, for example, which is sinking on the PISA results. The view that is driving a lot of public education reform is that there should be a return on the investment we make, but the return should be quick and should be short term. And this should be the primary thing that drives our reform efforts. So, if you go to Sweden, you'll see they have free schools, which are now independent of local control and are partly privately funded. The biggest owner of free schools in Sweden are hedge fund companies. Hedge fund companies. If you go to America, there are charter schools. If you go to England, there are academies. There, they have many purposes, but one of the prime purposes is to make a profit. The sale of technology to schools, hardware and software, the sale of data systems to schools for tracking and monitoring student progress. These are also an enormous source of immediate profit to gigantic global companies. And these are driving much of what we're doing now in public education reform. And if you want to increase your immediate profits, one of the things you pay attention to is to lower your costs. And the greatest cost in public education is the cost of teachers' salaries. So there is a massive move globally for salaries to be low rather than high. And this is not good for teaching. For teachers to be young rather than old, because they're cheaper when they're young. To keep them for a few years and then see them move on before they become expensive and difficult, rather than to develop them through the course of their teaching. And to have a view of teaching that is compatible with this, a view of teaching where it's not really like medicine or dentistry, it's more like parenting. It needs enthusiasm and knowledge of your subject and an ability to manage a class, but no particular skill. So it requires not much training, not much cost, not much preparation, certainly no depth of pedagogical knowledge that this institution represents. Can be learned quickly and then teachers will move on to something else. And this, this is one of the big drivers globally in educational reform now, to keep the costs of teaching down and to have an image of teaching where it is easy, not hard, that is compatible with keeping the cost down. This is the first. It's not completely irrelevant to Hungary, correct? People will do anything, by the way, to raise the quality of teaching other than raise teachers' salaries. 
Good teaching does not depend on a very, very good salary, but it does depend on avoiding a bad salary. This is true everywhere. When it, teaching needs to be a place where money is taken off the table. Singapore gets really good maths and science teachers because when they start, they're paid as much as engineers. And so they choose their occupation based not on the money, but based on their calling, based on what they want to do. So this is the first view. What's the second view? Well, the second view is a view that Michael Fullan and I stumbled upon when we wrote our a book uh, two years ago. So we didn't decide to write a book on professional capital, but we discovered a thing called professional capital in the middle of the book, something that we realized almost nobody had written about. And professional capital is simply this. If you want to improve the quality of teaching, you have to invest in it. You want a return, you have to make an investment. Then you have to grow and build your capital over time. You have to keep on adding to it. You have to keep on growing it. You can't just have people qualify and then leave them alone. Developing as a teacher is a lifetime commitment of learning and growth. And then you need to circulate your capital freely, just like you do in the financial world, so teachers can share their ideas and expertise with their colleagues in collaborative environments, committed to a common good inside their school and across their schools. In this view, teaching isn't easy, it's hard. It's technically hard. It's hard to teach a class that has many children with learning disabilities in your class and not in a separate class. It's hard to teach a class of ethnic diversity and increasing number of immigrants within your country who learn differently, think differently, speak differently. It's hard to recognize the early signs of autism or Asperger's syndrome. You need knowledge of how to do that. It's hard to know how the brain works and the different ways to engage students in their learning. These things are not easy. These things are hard, and they require three kinds of capital. Human capital, which is the capital, the knowledge, the skills we have as individuals, Social capital, which are the knowledge, the skills that we have together. We're, we're better together than we are alone. None of us has the answer to every question that is important to us in this room, but most of the answers are in the room if we can bring them together. Social capital. And a third that we felt was missing, there are big literatures on the first two, a third that Michael Fullan and I called decisional capital. And decisional capital comes from the field of law, from decisional law or case law. How do judges learn to judge? Judges have to make judgments, which means the evidence isn't always completely clear. Doctors have to make judgments because the brain scan does not tell them what is there. They have to make a judgment about the brain scan. And teachers make judgments, thousands of judgments, every week in exactly the same way, without always clear evidence. So developing judgments, developing decisions over time, this is a third kind of capital. When you put these three together, it's not quite so impressive as E equals MC squared but it does create a kind of equation, which is professional capital is a function of human, social, and decisional capital. Doesn't mean we add these, or we multiply them, or they're in the same amounts. We don't know, they vary. But professional capital is an interaction of the relationship between these three, and all of them are important. So let's break them down one by one. 
and I'll ask you a couple of questions along the way. Let's go first to human capital. Human capital is the obvious question. If you get the best people to begin with, you have to spend less time correcting, appointing the wrong people later on. It makes more sense to get good people to start with, then you don't have to spend a lot of time with monitoring and accountability later on in the system. So getting the best people you can is important. This is what high-performing countries do, like Finland, uh, Singapore, uh, Korea, for example. Uh, high-performing countries, you know this very well, uh, teachers come from the top 30% of the university graduation range. In Finland, they all have master's degrees. In, in Finland, if you're looking for a husband or a wife, if you're looking for a husband or a wife in Finland, your top two choices, one of your top two choices is to marry a teacher. Not because teachers are kind people, though they are, but you choose to marry a teacher because you know when you're choosing a future husband or wife, you're choosing the parent of your ch future children. Therefore, you are choosing the smartest person in the room to be the parent of your future children. That's why you choose a teacher, because in Finland, it's harder to get into teaching than it is into law, and it is as hard to get into teaching as it is into medicine, because the qualifications are high, the process is rigorous, the status of teaching is high because from the very top, from the Prime Minister and the Minister all the way down, repeatedly, people say the most important thing for our country is its teachers because the future of our economy and our life and our children depends on its teachers. The most important job you can do in this country is to be a teacher and that is signaled from the very top all the way through. And then people want to become a teacher because it's a calling, because you're contributing towards your society. If in higher education you have to do a trade and say, if we pay for your higher education, you must give so many years to us here in this country, you have failed to gain the motivation and moral commitment of your people. You're requiring a contract from them instead of a commitment from them. D do get your people to stay with you and work with you, but do it through calling and through inspiration, not through contract and through obligation. What you say all the way through about the importance of teachers for the country is vital. In Singapore, people say their first priority is their country, their second is their community, and their third is themselves. So somehow, getting that across everywhere is vital. And that means with yourself also. Hands up if you're a teacher. So the question for you is, when you go to a party, um, you're a teacher, so you won't have time. But, but when you do go to a party and somebody asks you, what do you do? What's your answer? A lot of people say, I'm just a teacher. I'm just, you say, no, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. And you say it proudly. In your schools, do they, if you're a director of a school, a principal, a head teacher, do you tell your teachers every day how difficult the work is and that's why they chose to do it? We choose to teach not because it's easy, but because it's hard and because it makes a contribution. The qualifications matter. The graduation range people come from matters. The rigor of the training matters. 
what we say about teachers and teaching matters, and so do the conditions of the work. In America recently, McKinsey and Company did a survey of people who'd chosen to do other things than teaching. And they asked them, why didn't they go into teaching? What do you think they said? What do you think they said? Well, one of the things they said was, if they went into teaching, they thought the work with the children would be fulfilling, but they felt the relationships with the adults would be dull. They'd not have very interesting adults to talk to if they went into teaching. So if your school is a place where adults do not talk to each other, you're setting a bad model for possible future teachers. If your school is a place where adults only gossip to each other about the children or the parents, then your school is a poor model for future teachers. If your school is a place where adults meet, you're tired and you complain and you talk about how much work there is to do, it's a poor model for future teachers. But if you are having exciting, dynamic, focused conversations about learning, achievement, and children's progress, then you are modeling what an exciting place this is to be for adults as well as to work with children. And more people will likely move into it as you model that for them. This is human capital. How do we attract the best people? The second is social capital. Social capital is who we are together. It's very powerful. In many domains of life, social capital is very powerful. When we are strong together, we are more effective than we are alone. This is true of children, for example. Uh, two children from two poor families one child has networks with adults who will help them and advocate for them, will do better than the child from the poor family who has no adults who will help them and advocate for them. This is social capital. It's about how much we trust each other. Does Hungary have high levels of trust or low levels of trust? I know the answer to this, but go away and look it up on the web because there are international indicators of levels of trust and they are, by the way, related to well-being. Do people collaborate? Collaborate doesn't just mean cooperate, make a deal. Nor does it just mean communicate, talk to each other. But it comes from the Latin word labore, to labor. Do people work? together in your school? Do they plan curriculum together? Do they look at each other's lessons? Do they communicate on the internet, which teachers in Korea do? Teachers in Korea communicate with other teachers more on the internet than they do with teachers in their own school. But they're collaborating, they're working, they're working together. There are many ways to do this. Do you inquire into problems of practice together? Do you do lesson studies like the Japanese and look at each other's lessons and give critical feedback? There's not just one way. You have to pick the ways that suit you. But the issue is, is do you labor together? Do you work together? And the key thing here, the ideal is to have high human capital, great people, and high social capital who work together. But if you had to choose, which would you choose? This is an interesting question. And there's a study that addresses this in New York by an American called Carrie Liana, who looked at 5,000 students in grade five and their maths results and correlated them with measures of the individual human capital of their teachers, their skills and qualifications, and measures of social capital, 
how much those teachers said they trusted each other, they worked together, they collaborated with the principal, and so on. And here's what she found. High human capital does not raise social capital. If your team isn't working very well, think if you have a football team or a handball team. If your team's not working so well, appointing one or two stars will not turn around the team. In fact, often, it will make the team worse. You will not transform your institution by thinking there's just that one perfect person and if I find them, everything will change. You'll be disappointed. But the opposite is true. High social capital raises human capital wherever it starts. And this is the fantastic thing if you're a leader. Because if you're a leader, usually in education, you don't get to pick all your own people, except over a long time. You have to lead the people you are given. And high social capital, which means can you get them to work effectively for a common cause, will turn a poor teacher into a good teacher and a good teacher into an outstanding teacher. And teachers know this when they move jobs. Sometimes they find when they move to another school they're a better teacher all of a sudden. And it's not because something magical happened to them. It's because of the colleagues that they have around them. When I went to Boston College uh, 12 years ago, almost, people couldn't believe their brilliance in appointing me at first. Because in my first two years, my numbers were off the charts. Books, prizes, grants, money, off the charts. They couldn't believe their luck or judgment. Then after about two years, my numbers went down. They took a dip. Was I too contented? Was I giving up? Was I enjoying the luxuries of the job a bit too much? No. The first two years were not a measure of what I was doing at Boston College. They were a measure of all the people who had worked with me and I had worked with before. Those measures were our shared achievement of 15 years of building trust, collaboration, common commitment, and Boston College got two years of payoff from that. At Boston College, it took me at least five years to begin to create the depth and web of support and networks that I had had in Canada before that. So the results went down, but then they went up again. I'd like to think what was achieved had something to do with me, but it had a lot to do with all the other people around me and the social capital that we created together. So the second question for you is, how do you build that social capital? What working conditions do you create so that teachers have time to work together away from the children? Teachers in Finland spend less time in the classroom than teachers in any other nation. But they spend more time talking to other teachers and working with them to plan effective teaching and learning. The time out of the classroom yields a return inside the classroom. This is social capital. And what's the last one? The last one is decisional capital over time. I have a question and then I have about a seven minute close. Is that okay? So as a question, a one minute thought for you, and then about a seven minute close. The question is this, in your experience, in your teaching, in the experience of the teachers you know, how many years, how many years does it take a teacher to reach the point 
where they feel completely on top of the job. If the class isn't going the right way, they know exactly any one of a number of strategies they can instantly use to put it in the right direction. If there's trouble breaking out in the back of the room, they know that trouble is breaking out there even before the people in the back of the room do because there's so much in the zone of the job. The question to you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands and I'll call out some numbers in English, I'm afraid, but you, someone might help me in Hungarian. The question is, how many years does it take to get to that point? Turn to the person next to you just for one minute. You have one minute, that's all. How many years does it take? And then I'll call you back together. Okay, let's take some numbers. Um, if you think the answer is one, what's Hungarian for one? I'll just put my hands up. If it's one, could you raise your hands? One year. Two. Three. Thank you, two hands there, three. Four. Five. A few. Six. Seven. Two, okay, thank you. Eight. Four of you, five. Nine. Nobody likes nine. Ten. More than ten. Okay. So many answers. Many answers. Here's the answer. Here's the correct answer. Uh, we took three studies, one of them our own. One in England, one in Canada, one in the US. And they looked at what happened in terms of teachers' impact on students' learning, what happened over the, over the course of their careers. And two things are relevant, but they're not the same. One is how committed are you? How passionate? How dedicated? How enthusiastic? How hardworking? How morally driven? How committed? The other is how capable are you? How good? How effective? Can you use many strategies rather than just a few? Can you manage a class? Commitment and capability. And what we found was this, across these three different studies. In the first three years, what you get is teachers are more committed than anywhere else. They're excited, enthusiastic, idealistic, will do anything, they don't sleep. They barely eat. They never have sex. They have no dependents, dogs or cats. All they think about is teaching all the time. And they give up. They're very committed. They're just not very capable yet, on average. They're very excited. They work really hard. But they're just not very capable yet. And um, the second one is this, late career. This is a big category and there are many different kinds of people here. You'll, you think often 
Mainly, they're these people. Mainly you feel they're old, they're expensive, they're in the way, and wh when they tell you they have a hospital appointment, you hope it's nothing trivial. <laughs> so this is how we characterize all teachers who were cynical, teachers who were bitter, teachers who were tired. We overestimate this group significantly because we don't take the time to get to know them. There are three other groups here. Some have lost the magic. They had the magic, but the magic's gone. But they can get the magic back. They committed themselves to big things in the past, but then the policy changed, or the money ran out, or the principal moved on, and they got disappointed. So just like people who've had several marriages, eventually, they say, unless they're Elizabeth Taylor, probably marriage isn't a good idea for me anymore. And teachers who've given themselves to change several times and always been disappointed, eventually will say, this isn't worth it. I'll just concentrate on my own class. I'll not get involved with anything across the school. But these teachers are doing good things in their own classes if you look, and they can get the magic back. The third group is based on a book by Susan Cain about introverts, people who are quiet, people who are even a little bit shy. And many teachers who don't want to get very excited about change, they're not against you, they're just shy. They don't like karaoke. They don't dress up on Halloween. They don't lead big changes with their whole staff. But they will work with two or three colleagues on something quietly if you connect them. This means as a leader, a way to bring about change with this group is not to say, this is the change, everybody do it. But it's to say, here's this change, here's another change, Here's another change. Here's another. Let's have three or four on this, two or three on that, and then we connect these different cells of changes together. If you do this, then you'll get more in this top category, people who, who you renew or who are able to renew themselves. So in this last group, in late career, on average, commitment is declining, on average, but not for everybody. And capability, there's huge variation, depending on the experiences that people have had. If you see everybody like this, you'll give yourself a big headache, you'll overestimate how many resistors there are, and you'll lose the trust and commitment of the rest. But if you accurately identify these groups here, this group will become very small, and the others will help you to fight them. Are you following me? It's very important. So this is the second group, late career. The golden cell is this one here, mid-career. Mid-career starts somewhere between about four years into teaching, but often the research shows eight years into teaching, when you're totally on top, when you're at the height of your powers. And the number of hours in teaching that eight years makes is 10,000 hours, which Malcolm Gladwell and many other people have shown is the time it takes when you're a musician to be orchestral class. It's the time it takes when you're a cook to become a master chef. If you just want to play music in the bar on a Friday night, you need about 4,000 hours. If you want to be orchestra class, it'll take you 10. So the implication is this. In mid-career, we need not only to keep people in the job till they hit that point, 
but we need to keep stretching and challenging them until they get to that point. Are you following me? But the leader puts all their attention here on people at the beginning. How can we get them started and avoid disasters? And then concentrates all the rest on the problems at the end. And with this group in the middle, we say, thank goodness they're okay, we can leave them alone. And this is the big mistake, because if you stop challenging and stretching this group, if you stop challenging and stretching them, in later career, instead of being renewed, they'll become disenchanted or they'll resist because you're failing. The good teachers need to keep moving on as well as the poor teachers. And that's the challenge for colleagues and for leaders. So what have we said? That the quality of learning in school is most affected by the quality of teaching. That one of the views of how to address this is headed as in the wrong direction. It's to make teaching easy, make teaching cheap, make it standardized, make it more like the 19th century than the 21st century. This is not a way to, to engage in and compete with the people around us. The other view is that teaching isn't easy, it's hard. Teaching is difficult, teaching is complicated. Teaching has to be done with other people, not done by yourself. So teaching needs good human capital, high status, sufficient pay, a strong sense of mission, vision, or calling. Teaching needs social capital, laboring, working together. And some of the best examples of how effective this is are from developing countries. There are 9,000 schools in Mexico significantly raising achievement on the principle that Every teacher has at least one good idea, and these ideas need to be networked with each other. In the Anglo-Saxon countries, the view is people in poor countries know nothing, so we'll decide what they should do, and we'll make them all do it. It's a top-down, Anglo-Saxon, British, American system you should not follow. The alternative is everybody knows something, connect those things that people know. Networks are at their most effective in some of the least likely places. And when you've got the right people and got them working together, then don't squander your investment by letting them go after two or three years. Keep them in the job. Keep challenging them. Keep stretching them. Give them those lively conversations that make them want to come to work with the adults as well as the children and then you'll build your professional capital. You'll grow it over time. You'll circulate it effectively. And the people who'll get the returns will be your children, your country, and your next generation. Thanks for listening. We would like to thank uh, Professor Hargraves uh, for this uh, tremendously um, thought-provoking and valuable uh, presentation, which I'm sure will help to achieve the goal of this conference as well. And um, in a way, uh, he mentioned, uh, among others, uh, uh, the PISA uh, results, which, which helps us, in a way, to connect our next uh, uh, presenter. Uh, because we are very uh, pleased to introduce uh, Professor Jean-Francois Rouet from the University of Poitiers. He is a senior researcher. He's a director of the National 
a center of research, the National, the National Research uh, Center. He is a cognitive psychologist and he is also looking into the connection of uh, the internet and technological uh, uh, achievements and uh, reading. Among his books, uh, we can mention uh, the uh, hypertext and uh, cognition, and uh, also the uh, skills of document reading. He's interested primarily in what kind of cognitive uh, abilities we need to make sense of uh, and to use uh, primarily web-based documents. And his presentation is also about that, which is about uh, web-based resources as challenges for uh, uh, students and teachers. Professor Rue. Good morning, Mr. Rector, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure and honor to uh, be here and uh, to be able to uh, address this uh, distinguished audience. In my presentation, I will focus on uh, one tiny aspect of the big picture that uh, Professor Hargreaves has just uh, brilliantly drawn for us, and this is uh, the relationship of uh, children with uh, information and communication technology, and especially the status of traditional skills, especially reading in uh, their ability to uh, effectively make use of these technologies. So I want to start with a little discussion of the status of reading in the present so-called digital era and then ask the question of uh, whether the new generation of students that some have called digital natives, uh, are they prepared for effective uses of the web, not only to play, but also in their academic, professional, and personal lives. So I will go a little bit into the issue of uh, what kind of cognitive theories and frameworks we need to explain what it means to read in a digital environment. And then I want to point out some key obstacles for proficient digital reading. And finally, uh, if I ever get there, I will uh, share some thoughts about uh, whether and how schools and teachers can help foster students' digital information literacy. So this is a digital era. This is the number of computers in use worldwide, according to recent figures from the ITU, International Telecommunication Union. And as you can see, there's presently about 1.5 billion computers in the world, up from uh, probably less than 100 million uh, 20 years ago. Uh, 70,000 of the families within the OECD countries own a computer and have an internet, a connection to the internet, and this is up from a mere 10% 13 years ago. So a dramatic and fast change in the level of equipment. On top of that, there's continuing innovation, and now the focus is on portable devices, pads, smartphones, there's about 6 billion of subscriptions registered as of 2012, and again up from less than 1 billion some 13 years ago, according to the World Bank. And there are two-digit growth rates in the sales of these devices, and um, uh, the trend is continuing. We still um, some heterogeneity across regions of the world, of course. For instance, the rate of equipment is anywhere between some 80% in North America and in Germany, for instance, to 60 to 70% in Spain, Italy, or France, 
to 50% in Poland, to 30% in Bulgaria, to less than 10% in Africa. Okay, so yes, it is a global village, but resources are distributed not very evenly across countries. This raise, this surge of uh, digital technology has um, uh, given rise to some beliefs about the distribution of knowledge and skills and education. And I will review some of these popular thoughts or beliefs about the digital era and its consequences for education and reading. There is a notion that uh, because of computers, now there is a fading of the book industry and that reading is not so important anymore because this is going to be a civilization of multimedia and virtual reality. So the very notion of printed text may be less important in the future than it was in the previous centuries. And then there is uh, this view that uh, we are experiencing these past decades um, digital gap between the natives and upcoming generations who were born with the technology, who know how to use it, our children who seem so agile and proficient in the use of these devices, and we, older people, who are not natives and who are less proficient and less able. So this is also something popular that needs a little reflection whether digital natives actually outperform older generations in their literacy and skills in the use of ICT. And there is a third point that is uh, found commonly in uh, publications related to ed education that uh, uh, current curricula and educational practice are getting outdated and uh, schools and educational systems should refocus their objectives and standards to adjust to these new cultures of the digital natives. Now I'm asking what it really takes for anyone on earth to be actually called a proficient user of a computer, of the internet, to be able to make use of this wealth of information and, and communication tools that surrounds us now. So I will um, review quickly a few examples, very simple examples of what people do in terms of learning from the web, and then ask what is the single essential skill that people need to possess to do this. Let's start with a student, let's say in a middle school or high school, studying with the web. I will get back to this example later. For instance, in a science class, let's say a ninth grader or a tenth grader could be asked to look up the web to find documents about the causes of global warming. And then they will ask a search engine and get links and browse these documents. So what kind of skills do they need to be able to do that efficiently? Now, if they study enough, they may end up on the job market. And here is another example. They will want to find a job. And there, too, there's, in many countries, developing online services to help people find a job. So then again, the question is, what is the skill that the user of this website needs to be able to actually find the job they need and interact with the job offers. If they do get a job, then they may be able to get money and to travel. And so when planning their trip, for instance, to Italy, to Rome, they may also find very good information and learn about Rome and how to get there and what to do. And then again, the question is, OK, what, what are the skills that are needed? And so in the end, what does it take to be a skilled web user? Well, here is my take on it. It essentially takes reading and more reading and more reading. The digital era means that people are interacting with written information system. There is not a single web page without a printed word or ideogram, depending on the language. So reading is everywhere. It has been everywhere in a long time. It was important in the development of societies for the past few centuries. As you can see, there's people reading and sharing documents up there on these wonderful paintings. But it has never been as important as today. 
The one thing that is confusing for us to understand is that the nature of reading is changing. We don't read the same things anymore and we don't read the same way. However, we keep reading and we keep being in need of excellent reading skills to be able to handle all these complicated technologies. At least that's an argument that I would like to develop and to discuss with you based on some of the research that has been conducted both at a small scale level, which is what I do in my laboratory, and at larger scale levels, like for instance, as part of this international survey that Professor Hargraves has uh, um, talked about in his presentation, the PISA, the PEARLS, and other sources of information. These sources of information tell us whether students are actually prepared to live in this all reading society. Let's take my first scenario. You know, this girl Lisa, she's a 10th grader. She's working on a science project on the issue of human activities and climate change. And she has searched the web and find, found a few interesting links. How is this reading? Well, for an hour, this student will likely use these materials to select links that she should read and interpret. And then she will navigate across pages compare and contrast contents, and eventually sketch some draft, make use of the information. This is all included in a broad view of reading literacy. At least it should be, and this should be reflected in the curricula. How good is the average teenage student at these activities? Well, since 2009, the, the PISA survey has a digital reading subdomain of reading that has given interesting information that I will summarize in a simple chart here. So this is 15-year-old's digital reading proficiency according to the 2009 PISA survey. I'm not giving you any international comparison here. The point is what percentage of the student population can achieve digital reading given the constraints of the tasks. This is what you see in this chart. Do I have a Pointer, maybe? Yes. Good. When the task only requires the scrolling, locating, and a simple navigation across a few pages, well, all the students who are in the capability of decoding printed words can do that. If you had little constraints like having to make selections or to transfer information, it's 83%. And as you go down the list, some added skills appear, and the percentage of the students who can do it actually drop. At level four, when students have not only to read and comprehend the message, but also to evaluate whether the message is accurate, something which gets arguably important in these days with tons of information being disseminated on the web without any kind of quality control, then only 30% of the students at the age of 15 can do it. And finally, when they have to conduct independent navigation across many different sites to gather and co collect and compare and contrast information, then the most difficult tasks are, are, are completed by only 8% of the students. So this is the actual picture of what the teenagers can do, far from, from this romantic view that being digital natives, they can do anything with a computer, including things that we cannot do. So no, digital natives do not acquire advanced skills from mere exposure to technology. It takes something else, perhaps education. But before, before we ask about education, we need to explain these challenges with more detailed theories. As you know, international surveys are not scientific studies and they don't, they rely on existing theories, but they, they somehow can also advance the theory, but the theory comes from other lines of study. So I will go into a little bit uh, the intricacies of the mental processes that are required to do these tasks to elicit some of the hard points, some of the problematic aspects of the tasks that students have trouble with. 
first of all, we have to look at what we call reading these days. To most people, if I would ask you, you would say, well, this involves decoding printed words and comprehending the message. This is a traditional view of reading skills. It is found in virtually all the books that discuss reading, scholarly book, books, pedagogical books. It's present in the mainstream theories of reading and reading acquisition. However, this view of reading as being able to decode and comprehend tend to be, um, let's say, limited when looking at this web-based selection of documents and reading, one can guess there is more than just decoding and comprehension. So more recent research has suggested that we need to have a broader view. This is actually partly reflected in the recent versions of the PISA frameworks and other related frameworks. And also, this is uh, being um, increasingly discussed among reading specialists. I myself has contrib have contributed a little descriptive model that, we, that we, I will take you through quickly to sort of explain why there is more to reading ability than just decoding words and comprehending written texts. In the fr this framework that I have developed together with my uh, colleague, Anne Britt from the United States, we acknowledge that reading begins before people even look at a text. The reading activity starts usually with an external reason to read. Especially if you are a student, you would like to go play, but your teacher is giving you an assignment. You have to understand this assignment. This is also true later when you work for a company and an organization, and you have a need to read. So the need for information, the need to read, is what drives one's orientation and engagement with text. But this is pending on one's ability to understand these needs. How well do students understand the assignments when they turn to the web to acquire information? This is really an interesting question, and it's not a trivial step, as I will show you, the interpretation of the external requirements. The second step is accessing to information. At that stage, the student will turn to document resources and try to locate a piece of interest, whether a website, a page, a section within a page, or anything. This involves several decisions that are also not trivial in the mind of the average 15-year-old student. They need to access information, and they do that using devices, whether in print or electronically. The devices in the electronic world are far more sophisticated, so you need to make use of the search engine, for instance, in a specific way. This is accessing. And then when you get results, then you need to evaluate. Most often, the result is actually not going to be relevant, not the best match to your needs. And then you're going to have to recycle until you get to an actual text. This is a price to pay to be in a situation where there are lots of information around you, but you don't have lots of time or lots of resources. So you have to make decisions, and these decisions are made through reading, right? And so this is part of the reading, or what should be a reading framework and um, curriculum. Third step, and third, uh, probably uh, most problematic aspect of uh, online reading is the issue of integration. Most often, our students have to read not just from one source, but from multiple sources of information. And they will need to assemble pieces of knowledge from their comprehension, interpretation, and evaluation of these various sources. They have to understand where the information came from, why it's providing possibly discrepant information about the situation. If you want to understand the debate about global warming, you do have to read from different sources. And I will return to this issue later. And you have to keep in mind that the information you have acquired from these sources is different because of the, the purpose of the writer who put that information up onto the web was different in the first place. Let me illustrate just a few, um, with a few examples, the difficulties for teenage students to achieve these complex processes as they read from the web. In, in one study that we did recently, we asked students from grade five to 12 to perform a series of simple web-like search tasks. We would give them simplified links 
in a Google kind of environment and ask them to select those links that they would find interesting based on this very simple search phrases, like, you know, you want to search information about the highest mountains in the world. Our links were designed so as that half of them were relevant, like a link that would give you information about high mountains, but half were not relevant, even though they did include relevant keyword, like the highest, highest railway of the world. So on the surface, this does have cues to relevance, but at a deep interpretation level, this should be rejected as not talking about the search result. So our question was, are teenage students able to sort out relevant from irrelevant links? And do they pay any attention to the presence of relevant keywords, especially when there is this kind of typographical emphasis those capital letter words that seems to shout at you, you know, take me, take me, I'm important. Here is a graph and it's a little bit complicated, but what you want to look at is a red bar here. These are fifth to 12th grade students. And the red bar is a proportion of cases where the student is going to take an irrelevant link because it has been marked with typography. This is about as frequent in our average fifth grader as selecting a, a good link that was not marked typographically. So in the mind of these students, the balance between shallow cues to relevance and deep cues to relevance is not good. They tend to make decisions too early based on an insufficient processing of the information. There's ways to improve this easy way, but it does take a little instructional intervention to take them to use the right level of interpretation when making these selections among web links. Let me move on now to another example and the challenge of now evaluating information. Assuming that information is topically relevant, the student should also be able to find whether this information is of good quality. This often takes an assessment of not just the content of the text, but also where the text came from, who wrote it, and for what purpose. This slide is the same as I showed earlier in my presentation. This is a case of global warming, and the anecdote is that it's a true slide this time. It, this was the list returned by the search engine Google at the end of 2011. This was before the latest report by the International Group on Climate Change, in response to the French equivalent of the causes of global warming, les causes du réchauffement climatique in French, up there. We know that uh, from, from previous research, most of the students at the age of 13 to 15 are going to make their selections among the th top three links. They don't even bother looking down the list. This is a fact. Actually, we don't either. <laughs> Most adults do that way. So the likelihood that they would go for the first link here is very high. And indeed, this is what, what they do. And let's take this first link that was popping out at the end of 2011 to tell us about the causes of global warming. And this takes us to a nice web page, very well written by professional people whose job is to give you simple, clear messages. I'm not going to translate it. It's in French, but I'm going to give you a summary of this, what this page is telling you. It's telling you that global warming is a, is a natural phenomenon. It's linked to the greenhouse effect, which is natural in its sense. And it has only perhaps been accentuated recently because of human activity. And the first people to blame are the farmers. This is agriculture, which is mentioned, which was mentioned in the version of this text four times. Yes, the burning of fossil fuels might also contribute, but they were mentioned only two times on this page, not as a main cause. Um, as they get older, we know that by the age of 15, some students, of course, have developed a greater awareness of the mechanisms by which our societies produce and exchange texts, 
so they know what a source is. But still, they remain quite gullible, and they pay attention to superficial cues to authority. For instance, in a study by Susan Brehm and her colleagues, they found that uh, 11th graders in the US would tell you that if it's written by a medical doctor, then it is reliable, no matter what. Okay, and it's easy to find examples of the opposite, of course, for many reasons that, uh, that you know. Um, there's other evidence from older studies of document reading showing that even college students sometimes have trouble. For instance, when reading about historical controversies, reading documents written by the authorities at the time, for instance, the US president, some students would say, you know, I'm not challenging this because this is the US president. A French student reading the same materials would say, oh, it's from the US, therefore it is biased. You know, so this kind of simple, clear-cut, essentially wrong kinds of reasoning, and we know it's not accurate because we compared it to what experienced historians would do when faced with the same reading situation. So there's a lot to learn, not only about assessing relevance and navigating, but also about evaluating sources. There's more and more research being done in this area. I want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank my colleague uh, Choba Play from uh, the University of Technology in Budapest, we have conducted also a study of navigation showing the troubles for young adults in uh, making sense of the overall structure of a website. And this, is, this adds to the picture that digital reading is very difficult even for grown-ups, not just for, for children. But there's, there's a lot to be learned and, and, and taught about these new ways of uh, reading. So. Uh, let me now quickly go to the, 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 the last part of this presentation and ask how can schools and teachers prepare students for this uh, 21st or should I say 22nd century reading, maybe. Um, to me, there's a clear need to upgrade, first of all, our own definition of what is reading skill. There's more to reading than just decoding and comprehension, right? And this is a growing awareness among specialists and educators to the need to expand the construct of reading skill and of course reading curricula. First of all, teach beyond reading comprehension. Teach search, teach relevance assessment, teach credibility issue, quality of information. This is part of the curriculum, this should be. And then of course this takes teaching reading beyond the elementary grades. One reason is that teach, uh, children at the age of 9 or 10 are not completely ready to understand the complex interplay of perspectives and authors and readers and texts. This is, this, this is not the outcome of recent research. This is what Jean Piaget would have said 50 years ago, that there is this issue of decentration that comes late in cognitive development, and it's clearly an obstacle for young kids to understand multiple perspectives, which means that it's now an issue for secondary education to teach reading at that level. And of course, this needs to be taught across media and across social situations, because there are consequences not only for academic reading, but also for professional reading and for reading as a citizen and as a human being in general. Okay? Now, the engineering of this new reading instruction faces a number of obstacles. It should be, of course, transdisciplinary. It's important for virtually any discipline. I've given examples in history and science, but you could you know, ask the same question about literature, if you're interested in literature. Uh, that's, so this is, of course, uh, a problem given the traditional content area teaching, which is still uh, uh, present in, in, in most educational systems, at least in the Western world. Uh, you need to accommodate for individual difference in component skill acquisition. These new skills should not come in lieu of decoding and comprehension. Decoding is essential, and you can't be a good evaluator of information if you're not a good reader in the first place. So, of course, as children go older, some are very good and some are not so good. So the teacher, the average eighth grade teacher, is facing this heterogeneity, at least in... in, in uh, in some educational system, and they have to accommodate for these individual differences. 
And of course, uh, last but not least, it's not just teaching about, it's not just lecturing the kids about all this. It's actually have them practice and understand and get feedback and repeat across a number of examples that will help them. There's a few um, initiatives uh, in the area of instructional technologies that are promising. People have developed uh, platforms and pieces of software to try to implement these uh, this skills and to overcome especially the issue of individual differences. And some of these projects have been uh, successful, but I will not have time to, uh, to re review them here. Um, just a few words maybe now to, uh, to conclude this, uh, this presentation. So what I've uh, essentially tried to say uh, this morning is that uh, being in a digital world means that people need to read more, not less, and for more important purposes, more diverse and important purposes. Reading online is not easier even for the younger generation. It, it's no less demanding than reading paper-based text, it's actually more demanding. And there's a, an increased emphasis on higher level, deeper level of understanding beyond comprehension. There is the evaluation of information and the integration across sources. This is arguably more complex a skill to acquire. So there's clearly a need to prepare our students for these forms of sophisticated reading, which will matter for many areas in their academic life and, and vocational, and as I said, as for ci even for citizenship. Uh, there's uh, a few good news in that uh, ICT, which is now more and more present in many schools, can be used effectively to some point to implement interesting procedures to force foster these kinds of skills in uh, children. But of course, this is an, an area where we need to make a lot of progress in order to come up with interesting uh, methods, proven methods to advance uh, the, the reading literacy in this broader sense. Before I finish, let me conclude with a brief epilogue. This is a cartoon that I found funny. It's a young kid uh, talking to his teacher and the kid has a computer, it's an old computer, but he's very proud about it. And then suddenly he finds this thing and says, you know, wow, that stuff is hyper-modern. He's talking about now this object here. Uh, it's light as a light laptop, so there's no downloading delay, and it works without any power cord. And how do you call that thing? And the teacher says, it's a book. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>